Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. So glad that all of you are here today. Those of you who are watching us in the Cross Point Center right now, I want to give a shout out to you and welcome you as you've joined us for this great day of celebration on Resurrection Sunday. Those of you who are watching us online, you've invited us to your home. We're so grateful that we can be with you. We're looking forward to the day when you can be back with us and we want to give you an invitation to come and join us this morning. And we are here this morning because we unapologetically believe at Scotts Hill that Jesus bodily rose from the dead on the third day and that he is alive now. Amen? We believe that. We're unashamed of that. Last year, we didn't have the privilege of meeting together like this in person on Easter Sunday. We met in the parking lot out there. You came in your automobiles. Many of you came in your pajamas last year. Most of us did not buy a new Easter outfit last year, so I'm so grateful that you chose not to come in your pajamas today. And then how many of you bought a new Easter outfit this year? You're wearing it this morning, or some of you are wearing the one that you bought for last year. Some of you realize it doesn't fit from last year. <laughs> So, but we're glad that you are here this morning as we can celebrate together Easter Sunday. You know, in the sporting world, if you, if you follow sports, you know that there's been a word that's been floating around out there for maybe, maybe a couple of years now, maybe not quite a couple of years, but it is a word that if somebody called you that word to your face, it would not be very appealing it would not be something that would be flattering. But if you're in the sports world and somebody called you by this name, then this would be something really good, really, um, really complimentary. Um, it's the word that reflects accomplishments and great achievements. And if you're in a world of sports in a particular area, this word means that you have excelled above all others. It's the word GOAT. You know what I'm talking about, goat, huh? The word for you, those of you who don't know what it means, it literally means greatest of all time. In all sporting events, there are goats, from professional football to professional curling. <laughs> there are goats, those who stand out. So what I've done this week is I've done a little study and research, and I've picked a couple of areas of sports that there are a lot of arguments about who is the real goat in these areas. And so I looked at football and I looked at basketball. And so I looked at the top three players that are considered goats. And there's a lot of dispute on who is the goat. So this morning, we're going to settle it right here. You're going to help me settle who the real goat is in these areas. The first one is NFL football professional quarterbacks. And the three are these. Of course, you got Tom Brady. You got Joe Montana. Montana, and you got Peyton Manning. Okay, so let's settle it right now. All those of you who believe that the real goat is Tom Brady, would you raise your hand and make some noise? Okay. Uh. All right. Y'all sound like goats. Um, <laughs> Joe Montana. How many of you believe it's Joe Montana? <laughs> Most of you here don't even know who Joe Montana is. Some of you are thinking, I didn't know Montana had a professional football team. What about Peyton Manning? Let's give it to Peyton. Huh? All right. Yeah, it's pretty even, you know, but, but you're all wrong. It's Drew Brees from the New Orleans Saints. I mean, I set you up on that, didn't I? All right, the, the next area is, is that of professional basketball. And, of course, the three goats are you've got Michael Jordan. Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't ask you to vote yet. You people are radical. There's Michael Jordan, and then there's LeBron James, and there is Larry Bird, obscene short wearer. So, okay. How many of you believe it's Michael Jordan now? How many believe it's LeBron James? Oh, y'all like, like from Cleveland or something? How about Larry Bird? All right, all right. It's none of those. It's Pete Maverick from LSU, <laughs> Baton Rouge. Okay, for those of you who don't follow sports, we want to do something really serious, okay? This is one that, that most of you maybe have grown up with and kids would appreciate. We wanted to see who the goat is in cartoons. So we got Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, and Charlie Brown. All right, all those for Bugs Bunny. Who do you think? Yeah. All right. All those for Mickey Mouse. 
Y'all must be going to Disney this weekend or something. How about Charlie Brown? You know? I think Charlie Brown wins it out. But you know, the thing is, we can have fun about this little phrase, goat. But it applies to a lot of areas in life, and a lot of people will ask an ultimate question. And that question is, who do you think is the greatest person of all time? I mean, when you think of all the people who have lived, statistics tell us today that they did some mathematical research and they discovered this, that since the beginning of time of humanity, there have been over 60 billion people who have lived and died. 60 billion. And of the 60 billion, the overwhelming amount of those people died virtually unknown. People never even knew their names. They left nothing behind. And of those 60 billion, there were some who may have made some kind of an influence that may have left a few ripples in their world. And then there were even less that may have made some kind of impact in the lives of millions of people. And then there are very, very few of the 60 billion people who have lived and died who have actually become household names. But there is one that stands beyond all of these, and he is elite. There is one who, at the mention of his name, either brings adoration or opposition, brings joy or anger. There is one, with every word he spoke, it has been sifted and studied, analyzed and scrutinized by philosophers and theologians and critics. There is one whose name is constantly mentioned throughout the world, and there is never a moment when people are not reading what he has done, learning what he has said, and seeking to apply it to their lives. There is one who is the greatest of all, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is no one like him. There's no one to whom we can compare anyone with. I want you to think about some of the things of his life. Jesus never wrote a book, but more books have been written about him than any other person in history. He had no formal education, but more universities and seminaries and colleges and schools are named in his honor. Jesus never owned any property, but there are more buildings around the world that are created to continuing his message of the gospel, the good news. He traveled very little about the size of a country of Wales, yet there's no place in the world, Harley, that has not heard of Jesus Christ. He never wrote a song. He never wrote a poem. He never wrote any composition of a play, yet there has been nobody where such an outpouring of songs and poetry and movies and films and videos have been written. He never raised an army, but there's been millions of people who have died for his cause. He only spoke to a few thousand people at any one time, but today his followers are almost two billion in number. Jesus. He is the greatest of all time, but I want to tell you, he is no goat. He's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And we are here today not just to celebrate his death. That was Good Friday. We are here today to celebrate his greatness because he rose from the dead on the third day and Jesus demonstrated that there is no one like him. There's no one to whom we can compare him with. And this morning what I want to do is take you deeper and further of the greatness of Jesus so that when you leave here today, you can leave here knowing how great he is. That truly there is no one like him. Maybe you're here today as a guest and, and, and you've come with family members because you're from out of town. And we're glad to have you here. Maybe you've come here because somebody promised you that you can eat lunch with them afterwards. And you're here. Maybe some of you have come because that girl or that guy is here and they invited you and you're more interested in them than anything else. Maybe you're here because you got caught up in the traffic and we directed you in our parking lot and you don't know where you are. But you're not here by accident. Because today I firmly believe that God wants every one of us to reflect on the greatness of Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. Take your Bibles, open to Hebrews chapter 1. It's towards the end of the New Testament. 
Or you take out your devices, look up Hebrews chapter 1. The writer of Hebrews is unknown to us by name, but he's not unknown to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that has led him to write the book of Hebrews. The whole book of Hebrews is about one theme. Jesus is greater. And in chapter 1, he gives us an overview of the greatness of Jesus. And here's what I want us to do this day. I want us to look at chapter 1, and I want to show you four reasons why Jesus is greater than anything. And we're going to break these down. We're not going to look in depth at them because there's so much theology there. It could take us weeks just to go through chapter 1. But the four things I want to leave you with today are four reasons why Jesus is greater than all. So pray with me and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you, Father, that because of that truth, we are here today to celebrate. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word this morning. And for those of us who know Jesus, Father, this would confirm in our hearts the greatness of our Savior. And Father, maybe some here this morning who don't know Jesus, this would open up their minds and their eyes, and they would see the greatness of who he is. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you ready? We're going to go fast. There are four things I want to show you today about why Jesus is greater. First is this. Jesus is greater because he outspeaks the prophets. Jesus is greater because he is greater than all the prophets that have ever come and have ever spoken. Verse 1 of chapter 1, the writer says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. The writer assumes that we know that God speaks. And how did God speak in the Old Testament? He spoke through his prophets. His prophets were the mouthpieces of God. They were the one who said, thus saith the Lord. They were the ones who would speak on behalf of what God wanted to communicate. Now, here's the interesting thing about the prophets. Everything they spoke was accurate, but it wasn't necessarily complete. In other words, they would give bits and pieces. They would share a little bit here, a little bit there, and they would give us truth about what God is wanting to reveal, but they didn't give the whole picture. For example, you can find in Genesis where Moses speaks about the Messiah coming and crushing the head of Satan, the serpent. But we don't go any further than that. Then you can go to Isaiah and you can find that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. We don't see any further than that. Then you can go to Psalm 22 or you can go to Isaiah 53 and you can find prophecies about the death of the Messiah, but we don't necessarily go any further than that. Then you go to Micah, and he tells us that he will be born in Bethlehem of Judea, which is true, but it doesn't take us further than that. So everything the prophets spoke were accurate, but it wasn't complete. Because God would use bits and pieces here to reveal what he is going to do. So how is it that Jesus is greater than the prophets? Let me give you two things. Number one, Jesus is the first word. He's the first word. He came long before any language on earth was developed. Jesus spoke long before there were nations and people and communication. John puts it this way in John 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. From eternity past, Jesus is the language of heaven. From eternity past, he is the first word of the Father. From eternity past, he is the agent of all creation. Jesus said, let there be light, and there was light. And with every subsequent word that Jesus spoke, it came to be. Jesus was the subject of every prophet. Jesus was the inspiration behind every prophet. Jesus was the truth behind every spoken word that God revealed to man. It began with Jesus. And from eternity past, he is the very first word. He was confronted by the Pharisees. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. There's never been a time 
where Jesus has not been the first word. But not only is he the first word, I love this, he's the final word. He is the final word. Verse 2, the writer says this, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. There it is again. Jesus is the agent of creation. But God is now speaking through his son. The prophets had a fragmentary uh, um, approach of um, prophecy. But every single prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus. Every single custom and every single celebration of Jewish festivals is fulfilled in Jesus. He is the fulfillment of all of it. And in the last days, God is speaking fully in revelatory terms of what his plan of redemption was. In the Old Testament, we see snapshots of it. In the New Testament, we see the truth that Jesus is indeed our means of hope and salvation. You see, Jesus is the person of the redemption that God has for us. His perfect, sinless life came to save us from our sins. His pain is demonstrated on the cross that he suffered for us. His price is demonstrated on the cross that he would die in our place for us and instead of us. We could see the propitiation that God gives us through Christ, that the wrath of God falls on him so that we can experience the grace of a loving God. And we see the power in the resurrection that the resurrection validates every single claim that Jesus has ever said. And we see the purpose for all of this is to the praise of his glory and his grace. Here's what's interesting. Every single book in the Bible is about Jesus. Do you know that? Every single book in the Bible points to Jesus. I'm going to prove that to you right now. We're going through all 66 books of the Bible. You think I'm kidding? In Genesis, he's the seed of woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like Moses. In Joshua, he's the conquering Lord. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he is um, the seed of David. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything that is broken. In Esther, he's our faithful Mordecai sitting at the gate. In Job, he's our redeemer whoever lives in psalms he's our shepherd in proverbs our wisdom in ecclesiastes our meaning for life in the song of solomon he's the loving bridegroom in isaiah he's the prince of peace in jeremiah lamentations he's our weeping prophet in ezekiel he's the son of man in daniel he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace in hosea he's the faithful husband in joe he's the giver of the holy spirit in amos he's our burden bearer in obadiah he's the judge and savior in jonah he's the risen prophet in micah he's our soon coming king. In Nahum, he's our strength. In Habakkuk, he's the watchman on the wall. In Zephaniah, he's mighty to save. In Haggai, he's our restorer. In Zechariah, he's the one who's pierced for us. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the servant king. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the savior of the world. In Romans, he's the justifier of our sins. In 1 Corinthians, he's our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, he's our comfort. In Galatians, our liberty. In Ephesians, our great reconciler. In Philippians, he's our joy. In Colossians, he's our completeness. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he's the coming king. In 1 and 2 Timothy, he's our mediator. In Titus, he's the blessed hope. In Philemon, our benefactor. In Hebrews, our perfection. In James, he's the power behind our faith. In 1, 2, and 3 John, he's our truth. In Jude, he's our security. In Revelation, church, lift up your eyes for your redemption draws. Now he's our king of kings, and he's coming back with 10,000 angels. The entire Bible is Jesus. It's not a book of history. It's his story. Think of this. The cross is the centerpiece of humanity. 
The centerpiece of all existence of the 60 billion people who have lived and died. In the middle of it, no matter how far we go forward, it is the cross. Everyone before the cross looked to it. Every prophet pointed to it. When Jesus died, he demonstrated that he is the one that is greater than the prophets. And now everyone past it looks back to it. You know, today the Jews still celebrate Passover and they have a cup called the cup of redemption and they never drink of it because they're still waiting for the Messiah. You see, many of us are looking forward something better. But God is saying, no, I want you to look back at what I've already done. And it's in Christ Jesus. Before there was anything, Jesus said, let there be light. He was the first word. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. My redemption is complete for humanity. He's the final word. Jesus outspeaks the prophets. He outspeaks the kings. He outspeaks the governors. He outspeaks the physicians. He outspeaks the persecutors. He is greater. And so I can believe every single word that Jesus speaks. I can trust every single word that he mutters because he is the first and the last. He is greater than any prophet. But it gets better. Secondly, he's greater because he outranks the angels. He's greater because he outranks the angels. In this Jewish world, there was a lot of thought and a lot of theology about angels. In their understanding, they knew that there were certain levels of life, whether it be physical life or supernatural life. They believe first there's the plants, then there are the animals, and then there are the humans, and then there are the angels or the demons, and then there is God. And in that day, many of them had begun to falsely worship angels. Now, there are the angels who continue to minister to God. They're servants of God, and they have walked faithfully before him. And then there are the demons who have followed Satan, who was one of the most powerful angels, who happened to be cast out of heaven because of his rebellion towards God. And ever since that point, Satan and his demons have been trying to counter work the work of the gospel. And so what happens is in that world, people had the false view of the significance of angels. But the writer of Hebrews is clarifying this for all of us. He says Jesus is greater than the angels. He outranks them and he gives two reasons. Number one, he has a more exalted nature. The angels are created beings that have very many limits to their, life, to their existence They can only be in one place at one time. They don't know everything. They're not omnipotent and all-powerful. There are certain limits to them, and there are limits to Satan and demons and angels. But Jesus' nature is highly exalted above all of theirs. Verse 3 says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God, meaning Jesus, and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. This one verse we could take weeks to unpack. But let me just show you the significance of his exalted nature. First of all, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. That means he's the same essence as God. He is God. No angel is that because they're created. Secondly, he is the exact imprint of God's nature. You see Jesus, you see God the Father. Everything about Jesus is the exact representation of God. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He knows all things. He is omnipresent. And so he's the same nature. No angel is that. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Not only is he the one that created all things, including the angels, but he holds them together. It's not a picture of Atlas carrying the world on his shoulder. It's not that. It's more like the picture of the song we used to sing as kids. He's got the whole world where? In his hands. He's holding it all. And he sustains every bit of it. No angel can do that. After making purification for sins, he is the Redeemer. He is the only one that the Father has chosen to come and take on humanity and die on the cross and rise from the dead. No angel has ever accomplished that. 
And he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. There's only one seat at the right hand of the Father, and that's given to his son. In the king's world, he had two seats, one on the left, one on the right. One was the counselor, one was the mighty general. Jesus is one seat because he is the wonderful counselor. He is mighty God, and he's the only one. No angel has that. In verse 13, he says this, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? See, Jesus is superior over all created beings. Because of his exalted nature. But let me give you this. There's a second reason that he outranks the angels. Jesus has a more excellent name. A more excellent name. I love what he says in verse 4. He says this. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. He not only has this exalted nature, but his name is more excellent. In verse 5 The writer says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. There's no one else in heaven that the father refers to as his son except for Jesus. And then we find in verse 6, and again, when he brings to the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Jesus took on human flesh, that's the incarnation, and at his birth, the angels in Luke chapter 2 worshiped him, Jesus never worships an angel. His name is more excellent. And the name he inherited is the name Jesus, which he was named, which means God saved. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what that means? That there's no one greater than Jesus. No one There is no king that has greater authority than Jesus Christ. There is no government in the world that has greater authority than Jesus Christ. There is no virus that can have greater authority than Jesus Christ. There is no angel, there is no demon that has authority over Jesus. And Satan is a defeated foe. He has no power over the one who has crushed his head on the day that he rose from the dead. No one. I want to tell you, we live in a world today where many people are joining forces with Satan. You may have read about this rapper by the name of Little Nas X. You know, he came out with his own shoe in honor of his own God. He calls it Satan shoes. And this Satan shoe has a number of things on it that you may be aware of. He's got the pentagram that demonstrates the worship of Satan. He's got the mark of the beast, 666. And this six here means they're only producing 666 of these. So this is six of 666. So it's got the mark of the beast. On the backside of it, it's got two crosses that are inverted, which symbolize that Jesus is impotent and has no power over Satan. It's got Luke chapter 10, verse 18, which is a reference of Jesus speaking, and I saw Satan thrown out of heaven like lightning to the earth. And what's most disturbing is in the sole of the shoe, there are literal drops of human blood. And with every shoe, you can buy this, and it's in honor of Satan. But here's the problem. Little Nas X doesn't understand the ultimate reality of his God. And that's this, that no human blood can ever, whether it's infused in the sole of a shoe, transform anyone. But the living blood of the risen Savior is the one that can transform every human soul and give life and hope and peace and joy and forgiveness And that Satan, it's interesting, he uses Luke 18.10 because that's a demonstration of his own defeat. Because he was thrown out of heaven. Jesus has conquered Satan once for all. He is a roaring lion, but he has no claws and he has no teeth and he has no power because Jesus is greater and outranks all the angels regardless who they are. And here's the good news. You and I never have to worry about who's in charge. 
We never have to concern ourselves with what's going to happen. We don't know. Satan is defeated. He has no power over the church. He has no power over the people of God. And Jesus is king, and he reigns forever. Jesus is greater because he outspeaks the prophets. Jesus is greater because he outranks the angels. But here's a third thing. Jesus is greater because he outlasts the universe. I love this. We already saw that he is the creator of all things in verse 3. But in verses 10 through 12, the writer says this about Jesus. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's the agent of creation. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Two things we need to know about this. The first is this creation will collapse. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, the second law of thermodynamics came into place. And the second law of thermodynamics tells us that everything in the universe is moving to chaos and destruction. We see it. Things are not improving. They're wearing down. Our sun is burning up 4.2 billion tons every second. There's going to come a time where things will wear out. And they will not last. All of creation is moving towards destruction, not towards organization. Science tells us this. The scripture tells us this. Peter tells us that the heavens are going to be burned up with intense heat. In Revelation, it tells us that the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, exactly what the language of this writer is saying. And we know that there's going to come a time when all these things will not last. Kings will not last. Governments will not last. These things are not going to last. Even AOC tells us this. She says the world's going to end in 12 years. <laughs> so what we see is that there is chaos. And all of the universe is moving towards collapse. But Christ will continue. He will continue a billion years, a billion, billion years, a billion times three. Jesus will be still seated at the right hand of the Father. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And here's the wonderful news. His character never changes. His love for us never dims. His compassion for his people never grows cold. His ability to heal never wears out. Jesus has no expiration date. He has no shelf life. He is forever. And he is greater than the universe. But here's the fourth one. Jesus is greater because he outlives the grave. That's why we're here today. He is greater because he outlives the grave. In verse 3, again, we go back to that. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Anytime a person sits, it means that the work is finished. And here what we find here is the work of redemption is finished. And he made purification for sins. How did he do that? He did that by dying for you and me. He did that by humbling himself before worldly people who envied him and hated him. He did that by being falsely accused. He did that by subjecting himself to a governor and being sentenced to die. He did that by letting people pull out his beard and punch him in the face and put a wicked crown of thorns on his head. He did that by standing before a tribunal and being falsely accused three different times. He did that by being strapped to a pole and beaten with a cat of nine tails until his back was just shredded bloody ribbons of mess. He did that as he put the weight of a cross beam and carried it to the cross. He did that as he was spit on and as he was cursed by the people he came to serve. He did that as he was forced to lie down on that rip open back and have his arms pierced to a cross beam and his feet nailed to a cross. He did that by hanging on a cross for six hours. He did that by saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did that by taking his very last breath for you and me. 
just to say that he made purification of sins is to miss all the things that Jesus did for you and me. He did that for us. He died. His body was taken down and put into a tomb. And then the rock was rolled in the front. While the disciples were broken, they were fearful. While the people who knew about Jesus were confused, you know what heaven was doing? Heaven was counting to three. Friday, one. Saturday, two. Sunday, three. And Jesus rose from the dead. And here's the thing. We do not at Easter just celebrate the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus without the resurrection of Jesus is powerless. The death of Jesus without the bodily resurrection of Jesus is futile. Paul says if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we are the most of people to be pitied. But his resurrection from the dead on the third day states that he is everything he ever claimed he was. His resurrection from the dead on the third day validates every single thing he ever said. His resurrection from the dead proves once and for all that he fulfilled the plan that God had for the redemption of humanity. And he's the only hope for you and me. And Jesus said this to his disciples. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I am the resurrection. I am your hope. And in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, he says, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forever. And I have keys of death and Hades. Jesus is greater. He's greater than all things. He outspeaks the prophets. He outranks the angels. He outlasts the universe. He outlives the grave. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is God's son. He is the sinner's savior. He is the centerpiece of civilization. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea of literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged and he rewards the diligent. He is the key to knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance. He is the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway to holiness. He's the gateway of glory. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't get him out of your heart. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, and they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. He's the greatest, and his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. And how long is that? Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And after all the forevers, amen. He is the greatest. That means this. His word is true. His authority is settled. His stability is forever. His resurrection is our life.